Welcome to a new edition of the Neon Jazz Interview Series with jazz trumpeter, composer, arranger, producer, band leader, educator, and all-around busy cat, John DeVersa. These days, he is busy teaching at the Frost School of Music at the University of Miami and promoting his brand new 2016 album called Kaleidoscope Eyes that features John covering Beatles tunes. He was born in L.A. but really raised in Oklahoma, and today he is in Miami. He is very well educated and has been on some big stages in his life, like the Today Show, Late Night with David Letterman, the Hamburg Music Festival, the Monterey Jazz Festivals, and many, many others. He has been all over the jazz world and crossing genres playing music with the likes of Fiona Apple, Michael Buble, Cheryl Crow, Bog Mincer's Big Band, and on and on and on. He has great stories, wisdom, and some other tales to tell. So please get to know John and dig this interview, my friends. Thanks for taking the time out for me. I appreciate it. Oh, it's my pleasure. I appreciate your uh, support and your interest very, very much. Right on, man. I'm going to go ahead and dive right in here. And I'm going to sure. just, in your own words, give me an idea of what has been going on lately, just kind of a snapshot of things, activity. A snapshot of activity. Well, we released the, the new record on May 6th, a Kaleidoscope by Music of the Beatles. And... Uh, so I've been traveling around doing some release shows, and you know we just finished. Also, my, the other part of my uh, world is, is teaching at the Frost School of Music. So we just finished up another year at the top of May, and we had just gone to we took the band to the Monterey Next Generation Jazz Festival, and just got back from that. And I'm starting to I just got back from LA uh, a couple of days ago, where we played at the Big Potato two nights over Memorial Weekend. And uh, Maya Sykes came and sang with us and, and uh, kind of deep into promoting the album right now. So talk to me a little bit about Kaleidoscope Eyes. It seems to me to cover the Beatles would have to be not only a, a difficult kind of a thing, but also fun. What's that like? Well, it's, it's an interesting idea, right? You kind of have to have no fear with it. First of all, the idea of of taking Beatles songs and, and uh, reimagining them is not a new idea. It's been done over and over and over and over by jazz artists. That's what jazz artists do. I mean, they're the, these, these iconic, rich catalog of the Beatles is uh, their, their standards now, basically. So the idea is not a fresh idea, and, and my band and my music has always been in the spirit of uh, being fresh and progressive, but... I just I thought it would be a great way to get some some eyes on us and and I I was kind of into the challenge to see if I couldn't bring some people in that might be a little bit jaded and then and then you know and see if we can't get some explosions to go off. So the process was I took you know a, a, a summer last summer I guess it was and and I uh, put the headphones on in the middle of the night and I. I just listened to the, to the music so deeply and, and watched every uh, interview I could find and read every interview and went into the, the whole Beatlemania phase and fell in love with the music again and learned so much from studying the sound design uh, of all the production. And, and then, of course, you have to put it away. You have to just put it somewhere else because it exists that way on those recordings. And then I started to hear the music through my own lens, as I did, as it just started to to reflect back at me uh, through my own perception, and and started to hear it in different ways, and and I had a list of you know a hundred plus songs that, of course, I was inspired to, to to try and arrange, and and I just started to take them one by one as they as they came to me. You know, one of the stories is that I, I was actually, you know, a lot of it was written on planes and in transit. And, you know, I was sitting on a plane and I was trying to figure out which discern which song was going to come next. And uh, there was a guy that was sitting diagonally from me in the plane and, and he was watching some movie. And and uh, and I said, you know what? I wonder if he's going to go to his iTunes right now. And And he did. <laughs> and I said, okay, I've got I've got some attention here. And then I said, you know what? I think he's going to choose a Beatles tune out of his iTunes catalog. And sure enough, he started scrolling down, and he had every album from the catalog uh, on his iTunes. And I was flipping out, like, wow. <laughs> and I said, well, you know, whatever tune he he chooses next, 
that's going to be the one that I that I arrange. And sure enough, he uh, he chose Here Comes the Sun, which is one of the ones I was really thinking about doing next. And and he uh, he listened to it for about 20 seconds and then closed iTunes and went back to his movie. You know, so all kinds of, of interesting little happenings like that. Uh, and I also, you know, I, I chose to to choose, you know, all the songs are so well known and recognizable. But for the instrumental versions of the songs that I was doing, I felt like I needed to choose material that was really, you know, the most iconic and recognizable of their of their tunes. So there's more possibility to uh, to manipulate and fill and still be recognized what it is. Absolutely. You know, the one thing, too, I'm a pretty big student of the Beatles, and I remember mm. when, when ABC put out that series, I learned more about those guys. And the way they approached that documentary was to allow the Beatles, there was no voiceover ever, and it was all from the Beatles' perspective. I mean, they had George Martin, and they had, you know, all kinds of people that were part of that outfit describing mm-hmm. what was going on. But one thing I remember, and I don't know if I heard it in that or where I heard it, but they said that Paul McCartney never listens to any of the covers. It's not that he doesn't sanction the Apple Records kind of conglomerate to bless it. He just doesn't right. listen to it. What have you heard about him and and Ringo listening to what is recreated from the Beatles? You know, I don't know. I haven't heard anything about that. Uh, you know, there there are a couple people that are that are close to the to the members in his band that I know and and of course they all want to get copies of the record so so Paul could hear it which would be an amazing experience but uh I certainly wouldn't expect that to be on on his radar but I don't know what his policy would be on that I yeah. certainly would understand it if he, he you know there's just so many it's just infiltrated with people doing doing covers of certainly Paul songs and the Beatles and and I don't know about Ringo either let me ask you this. Let me get to the beginnings of your life. Where did you grow up? Where were you born and raised? Well, I was born in L.A. You know, my, my dad was a studio musician. He played trumpet uh, in the, for film and TV in L.A. when I was growing up. So musicians were always over at the house, and, and I knew that lifestyle, you know, from looking at it as a kid. And, and then uh, and my mom was a musician, too. She's a, a piano player and a flute player and singer. And uh, and she was always playing music in the house. She was always playing a lot of R&B, actually, and classical music. And, and then we moved to uh, a small little town where my mom's from in Oklahoma, Ada, Oklahoma. And I feel like that's where I really grew up. So I was uh, about seven or eight years old when we moved, and, and I lived there until I was 14. In a small little town where, where you know, there's, there's not a whole lot of people, and but it's a rich, vibrant community of musicians, and, and that's where I started playing trumpet a bit. Um, and then I then I moved to Sacramento the first couple of years of high school, uh, where there happened to be a, a really great uh, jazz band there. The director's name was uh, Craig Fagnani at Rio Americana High School. And that happened to be the really cool thing to do was to be in the jazz band. And uh and so I started to really fall in love with improvising and playing playing the horn and and uh, and then two years and I finished my last couple of years we the family moved back down to LA uh, where I did my last couple of years of high school at Hamilton Academy of Music, uh where there was a really strong jazz program and I met some musicians that I still play with today. Mike Elizondo was there uh, the producer and bass player and Justin Morrell and uh, Trevor Lawrence, the producer and drummer. And we had a band together and uh, we were all pretty serious about it. And we had had uh, a lot of really deep musical experiences. And that's where I started writing, you know, at Hamilton. And and then I stayed in L.A. I decided to go to UCLA for college. And I studied classical music in college because they didn't have a jazz program there. Uh, and then started working in town a little bit. And, and then I uh, took a job at, uh, in Europe for three years uh, as a musical director for an ice skating show called Holiday on Ice. It was another very interesting experience. Uh, and then I came back to L.A. So L.A. was always a, a hub that I came back to. And now, of course, I moved to Miami, where I'm the chair of the studio music and jazz department at the University of Miami. So you've always been kind of going after the sunshine, so to speak. <laughs> well, yeah. uh, I haven't. I have to say, I have not chased it. It's just where I've ended up. 
<laughs> uh, so it was it was meant to be. Yeah. Uh, and I you know I had no intentions of leaving L.A. really, and and this opportunity in Miami came up, and you know it's it's one of those leaps of faith. You know I I had a a feeling that that's what uh, what I was meant to do, and it's opened up a lot of wonderful things for me. And it's it was at a time too when you know my small band was starting to travel and tour a little bit and I realized certainly in this day and age you can really live anywhere uh and make things happen you know if you, you create your own reality wherever you are and uh and so that's that's happening right now beautiful let me ask you this why did you pick the trumpet oh boy there's a question well yes. as i told you my my dad was was a trumpet player so that influence was certainly there although he never pushed it on me that's for sure if anything i th- i think he saw it as something that was really difficult and and he would, he would have said you know john if you're going to play 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 bass or play piano you know cuz you work all the time on those on those instruments and I, I there's just something about the sound joe that that i i i'm just really drawn to and it's it's interesting to me because I really you know I've always struggled with chops on that instrument and but nothing can keep me away from it either. <laughs> I just yeah. and I found a way to play it that's just really it's really personal to me and it, it really connects with the sound that's in my head as a voice. So it's just it's just part of my voice. I was attracted to it. But you know the, the silly story I'll tell you is that you know when I was in Oklahoma uh, and first learning how to play the trumpet. The, uh, we'd have these school assemblies where all the, the students would go to these school assemblies and the trumpet player would play Call to the Colors. Yeah. To introduce the assemblies. So that was yeah. a way of um, getting some attention, uh, in front of all my peers. That was uh, one thing I remember thinking that, oh yeah, I'll play the trumpet because I can do that. <laughs> you know, all those little things. Yeah, absolutely. So was there a jazz album when you were getting into listening to jazz that really kind of stuck with you, that moved you? Oh, you know, one of my favorite exercises, I do this with my students, is is to write down, to start making a list. I did this on a plane one, one day. And you just start writing down every piece of music that you've ever heard that gave you goosebumps, you know, that gave yeah. you that inspiration, that passion. And, and you know, uh, over the, I think actually my, my computer ran out of battery. It's the only reason I stopped, but I got to about page eight. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you just go, and, and you start to see what your your preferences really are, you know, the things that there's, there are commonalities within those, those selections and those artists that are a part of you. But to answer your question, for, for jazz records, you know, I mean, and, and as a kid, I wasn't all just top 40 in country. And, you know, I love 40 in country and R&B and, and groove-based music. It just makes me want to move, you know? And, yeah. Uh, but jazz, jazz records, I mean, kind of blue, of course. You know, that was one of the first ones I remember my dad uh, played it for me. I was like, whoa, what is that? And, and, uh, there's, there's yeah, actually a, a, a record that my dad played on, a Stan, Stan Kenton record. Uh, this was more when I was in high school that I got into it. It's called Stan Kenton Conducts the Jazz Compositions of Deep Art. Probably only sold about 10,000 copies. It was the last record Stan did for Capitol. And it was very free. It was 1967. You know, it's almost like an ornette approach. And it was a big band, and there was no piano except for one tune and no guitar. So just bass drums and, and these horns that operated like comping instruments. And, and there were basically two soloists. It would play on every tune, and it was just very free form. The music was was organic and raw and energetic, and I've always been inspired by by the writing and the playing on that on that album. And I remember, you know, I went to Japan as a as a teenager with the Monterey All Stars, and I bought a one of the first CDs when they first came out, a Chet Baker trio record that he did in Europe. I don't even know the name of it anymore, but just the sound of his trumpet. It was so soft and gentle and and communicative and expressive and emotional and uh I really was was I gravitated toward that a lot. So a lot of a lot of chat, a lot of miles miles four and more and you know the my funny Valentine the Carnegie Hall concert, you know, blew my mind, that's for sure. Coltrane. All of them, all those iconic records. You know, you you go from one then it just brings you to the next one. Yeah, yeah, it really does. It's kind of like that uh uh, it's like dissecting a sentence in English. It's just like all the lines just keep moving off of the main line. You know? <laughs> yeah. 
the capillaries off the artery. So let me ask you this. Has it always been music for you? I, obviously, you grew up in a musical household. You've been around music. Did you have any other dreams of, of what you were going to be at this point in your life, or was it always music? The dreams were always music. Now, I I saw, you know, the challenges and the struggles that my my parents went through and, and their their friends and colleagues and that that did scare me when I was when I was a young younger person you know I, I didn't want to have to struggle to make a living and so you know there, there I had my doubts about if I could do it or not but by the time I was in high school I just I knew in my heart that if I did anything else I would just be miserable you know at that point the, the funny thing at that point is as a younger person I saw all the the jazz artists around me, and I, for some reason, I, I attached myself to the to the uh, symbol of the the starving artist, and uh, I just decided that I was going to do this, and, and I wasn't going to make any money doing it. <laughs> and so, and of course, yeah. so then I didn't. It's just kind of a myth, and, and you you create your own reality. As I was saying a moment ago, and you know, when I got older, then I really realized that you can. You can have everything if you choose that, and and uh, you can create a world where if you are, and especially now in this day and age, you really can control every aspect of your career if you're proactive active about it and if you're forward thinking about it, and if you're passionate about what you're doing and you also have uh, a good amount of of, uh, of thinking skills and foresight, uh, you can put that together, and that's when explosions happen. So so that changed in me, you know, when I when I would become became a little bit more mature. But as, as far as what my aspirations were, my dreams, and my ideals, it always was was uh, to do with music. That's what uh, that's what would get me inspired and, and pumped up to wake up in the morning. It's the last thing I was thinking about when I went to sleep. Is is music it just fills up my whole body. Right on. So let me ask you this: you, you know, the real classroom obviously is the world, and you know that really well. But you know, in the formal environment, you got a BA from UCLA, a master's degree from CalArts, a doctorate from the University of Southern California. In a formal environment, what have you really learned? What's the big takeaway that you've gotten that's groomed you as not only a musician but also as an educator now? It's, it's to, to not make a separation between the educational non-real world, if you will, and the real world. To me, it's all the same thing. And, you know, what, as a student, I, I learned so much from my professors in terms of both what to do and what not to do and how to be and how not to be. And I found so many mentors. And, and, and probably about 20% of it, maybe less, was information. And, and the other, the other 80%, the other 90% was just watching people and how they are and how they exist and how they approach dealing with people and dealing with circumstances and dealing with gigs. It was just a, a place where you go every day for mentorship. It's really about the people that you, uh, surround yourself with. So that's the most important thing, I think, about being in, in a university setting because you're with these mentors every day and all of that rough rubs off. It's kind of like an apprenticeship because we don't really have apprenticeships anymore in the way that we we used to 100 years ago, 200 years ago, 300 years ago. Uh, now we go to universities, but it's basically the same thing if you see it that way. So you want to try and hang around your professors and go to their office hours and, and really, uh, you know, you find the ones that you really relate to and, and just be with them all the time. Uh, all of that gets absorbed uh, in miraculous ways. So that's what I think I picked up the most. So obviously things have worked out in a lot of ways, and I'm going to kind of delve into the performing part of your life. And you've gone on to big stages, the Today, the Today Show, Late Night with Letterman, Oprah Winfrey, Hamburg Music Festival. We could go on and on and on. What what is what has it been like to be on big stages like that? To be, to be kind of self-actualized as a jazz musician that's out there doing it. Yeah, it's it's uh it can be a surreal experience, you know, you it's like you're watching yourself being watched. <laughs> and and you just go out there and it's you know, it it doesn't matter if it's you're playing in front of 50 people in a small little club and everybody's crammed in together, uh, like I did just last weekend, and but the energy's right and it goes back and forth, it's it just completely fills you up or if you're in a, you know, I remember doing it was in Europe. I think it was in Cologne, and we played, you know, one of those big arenas. 
and it was uh, a show. It wasn't a jazz show, but there was 40,000 screaming kids playing in the show, and, and to hear these 40,000 kids just going nuts, <laughs> you know, uh, is, is, is a whole... It, it's basically the same experience, only it's just louder. But the energy, yeah. <laughs> the energy is the same. And you just watch it and 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 detach a little bit from the experience and and try to be inside of the the emotion of what you want to express with the music, no matter what it is. So it's the same, and and you just go along with the with the ride of the, of the energy of it. Uh, it's it's definitely a trip. I love it. And you've also kind of gone away from jazz. You perform with Fiona Apple, Cheryl Crow, and obviously, you know, even in jazz with the Yellow Jackets and Michael Bublé. What's it like to be up against and with talent that's that big and has that much uh, energy and that many years of experience? There's, there's the uh, I, I see every situation and circumstance as a mentorship type situation, and and you watch and you observe and you ask questions and you you go into it with both a, an open mind and a learning mind, but also all the time never uh, losing yourself and the confidence in, not in an ego way, but, you know, I, I, I feel everybody walking on this earth is, a, for, forgive the term, but a, a, a badass in, in some way, you know, a genius in some way. It's something that they do. And so, you know, there's, there's stuff that I do that nobody else can do. There's stuff that other people can do that only they can do. And so we all kind of dip into the same soup. And so don't lose your, your own integrity but be humble and and try and absorb from all these masters of what they do. That's the fun of it. Absolutely. So let me ask you this. In 96, you create the John Diverse Progressive Big Band, which is a force on its own. Talk to me about that band and how you feel about it. Oh, it's it's family. It's That I started in L.A. It was uh, right after college, my undergraduate degree. And I decided I wanted to start a band because I knew that the big band would be a platform where I could use my writing as a voice, but I also could play and improvise and uh, and, and have that part of my voice uh, expressed as well. And so I, I put together some of the best uh, musicians in L.A., and, and including that iteration of the band. It's uh, John Guerin on, on drums and uh, Bill Perkins, legendary West Coast saxophone player, who I just adore. And man, we made some great music together. And I was so, I was writing a lot of music. And those gigs, you know, I was a 20 something year old writer and, and all these veterans came in and, and they gave me everything that they had. And, uh, it was, they, you know, again, not making a whole lot of money. We were just playing clubs. Uh, they're doing it for the love of it. And there's something about that that's really special. You know, when people come together for something that's, uh, really about the music and nothing else. And so those personalities have stayed with me all all throughout. You know, there's certain members that have have changed out now. Now Gene Coy plays plays drums, and and Jerry Watts plays the bass, and and Zane Carney, and that's been the, the iteration of the last ten years. And I am so loyal to the to them for what they've given me, and I, and I feel it reciprocated back. And we've logged so many hours of music together and so many gigs together that's it's completely irreplaceable and invaluable nothing can replace that and it just continues to evolve every time we play it goes to a different place uh, as we all have different uh, accumulation of, of experiences to, to bring to the table you know every next time that we play so I, I'm so grateful to them and to that band let me ask you this. I'm going to go into kind of the awards section of your life, and you've been awarded a lot of things, the Herb Alpert Award, David Joel Miller Award, finalist for the Thelonious Monk International. So let me ask you this. I don't want to know what your favorite award has been, but I want to know which one did you get that just kind of hit you in a way that was surprising, and you were like, wow, I just did not expect that. And maybe at a certain period in your life it was more special. I don't know. <laughs> that's a that's a good question. I you know maybe maybe that award has not come yet. That's the the secret of it all is having no expectations. You know you just kind of flow through and be in the moment and and things happen and it's like oh okay that's nice. You know but always make it about the music. Always make it about the music and and great things happen. I like that answer. So you've been well educated. When you get to a doctorate level, you've seen and been in a lot of classrooms. 
and you're a teacher. <laughs> yeah. So let me yeah, let me ask you this. What advice still ruminates in your mind, really penetrates who you are, that that, that always comes through? It's it's always there and it never leaves you. Who gave you that? What is it? Well, from other people, it's it's uh, always things that are a little inexplicable. It's it's a feeling. It's a uh, if you you see a conversation that somebody has with somebody else. It's uh, you know Bob Mincer has been such a great mentor to me, and I just really admire the way that he treats his musicians and and the way that he goes about his business is very very kind and when when he gets to the music it's look out <laughs> you know he he yeah. no matter if he's been on the uh, on the road for or on a flight for uh 40 hours and he just got off the flight and he has to play that gig man he gives it everything he has or even the the, the dean here at uh, Miami who I've known for many years Shelley Berg uh the, ins- the the inspiration that he every time he goes to make music it's just so enraptured with emotion and you know all those things that you pick up from different people but you know i try and think about four things for my life when when i have them all in line that's when everything is just cooking and and you know the the, the number one thing is to live with immense gratitude for the now just you 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 can feel the the love of of you, you and i having this conversation the time that we had to talk about things that are important to us and uh, and to share our experiences together, and whatever that moment is, the gratitude for it, and and then to have integrity, uh, integrity for it, you know, knowing that you've got this genius thing in you, but being humble enough. That's the third thing. You're having humility uh, to to be able to to be have an open channel and learn and be receptive when you need to be receptive. And then the fourth thing is what I mentioned before. You know, realizing that you have all of those things going on in, in your life or in the moment, but having no expectation for what's to come. Sure. Or another way to say it is is uh, just immense gratitude for the moment and having excitement for what's to come. That's when everything aligns. Absolutely. So as the department chair at the Frost School of Music at the University of Miami, what do you want to give to your students? Oh, I want to give them uh, creativity and imagination uh, inspiration i want to give them i want to empower them with the confidence uh to know that whatever that fire is inside of them that wants to make the music that they want to do they can do it i want to tell them that whatever they can imagine they can do uh and can we can figure out the tools that they need to to make it happen and to eliminate any fear from their ideals so I, I think that that's the main thing you know here at the frost school we can definitely provide all the mechanics uh, for their trade, and then also fuel it with fearless creativity and imagination. So let me ask you this. All the albums that you had talked about that were formative for you from Kind of Blue with yeah. Miles Davis and then all, Chet Baker and all these guys, let's get let's let's kind of get into a, a magical version of things here. If you could get into a mm. time machine, where would yeah. you go and who would you witness live? Where would you want to go? Oh, man. Wow. Well, I would love to go hear uh, one of those Stravinsky ballets, you know, maybe, uh, uh, you know, Petrushka, especially or Rite of Spring or Firebird, you know, one of the premieres. I mean, Beethoven, yeah. <laughs> when he premiered the Ninth Symphony to be there yeah. Yeah. when that was happening. Oh, my goodness. Or or uh, Mozart, you know, to be at uh, the opening of the Magic Flute. <laughs> uh that would be unbelievable. Or or to be a fly on the wall when Chopin is, is writing one of his nocturnes. Uh, to be at uh at one of the, the bitches brew sessions. Man, yeah. Uh or or uh one of the you know, the, the Bill Evans trio sessions with Cafaro. Certainly to be at the uh you know, Love Supreme session, just to be a fly on the wall there. Yeah. And then and then to be <laughs> uh how cool would it be to be at one of the original, uh, you know, James Brown concerts or Prince? Oh, my wow. goodness. Yeah. I would love to just go in and, and, and be part of that, just witness part of it, and see how they, they lead their bands and, and, and see their own integrity and humility at, at play. Uh, oh, man, that list would go on for, for uh, forever. I may have to yeah. make that list. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, there's a there's a venue. It's closed down. It was an old blues venue 
but rock and roll acts would come through. It was called the Grand Emporium, and it was around for a long, long time in Kansas City. And back in the 90s, I believe it was the early 90s, Prince got done with the show at well, our big venue at the time, which was Kemper Arena. And I guess he called the owner of the Grand Emporium and said, I'm coming in. And I guess they got enough people in there, closed the doors, and Prince's energy was unbelievable, just as right. fierce as it was when he was in the show. And people that yeah. went to that show say it was something that will never be matched. It's the, you know, it's like watching Beethoven and doing the ninth. It was unreal. So um, I, I was imagine. Loving, I was loving when people talked about that. So let me ask you this: it's a very simple question, but why do you love jazz? Yeah. Oh, it's it's uh, jazz. That's one of those. Uh, it can mean so many things, right? Yeah. Uh, I I. The the part that I love about jazz is the adventure and the the improvisation, you know, and and the fearlessness that it takes to just jump into the void and see what happens uh, with no preconception. And but you know, and, and all in the same breath to say that you can do that with any kind of music. <laughs> you know, that yeah. you, you can do that uh, with all the music that I just mentioned, from from Mozart to James Brown to whatever. I mean, that's in every music, so it's not. Uh, specifically jazz, but there's something in the nature of jazz that is uh, exploratory and uh, in the nature of it that is inventive and in the nature of it that is fearless uh, that I that I do uh, gravitate toward. They're really uh, it, it's an accepted idea that we're going to jump into something and and have no preconception. So I think that's a good starting point. <laughs> if yeah. we're going to take a music, that's a good starting point. If we're going to do it with jazz, absolutely. What's the nicest thing a fan has ever said to you? Oh, well, you know, you travel around and there and play shows in, in different places and and meet all kinds of different folks, which is really really fun. And sometimes it's it's uh, you get tired. You know, it's it's a it's a it's a it's a long haul doing these things and uh so sometimes you question it's like oh man can i really muster the energy to 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 really bring it tonight and and of course once you play the 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 show you know you get invigorated by the music and the musicians and the crowd and it's no problem and then, and then you finish and then uh there have been times where where some some audience members have come up to me after and, and they've expressed how i'm thinking about one in particular right now how they had had a really difficult and challenging year and they were contemplating contemplating suicide and uh for some reason they got themselves to get out and come hear the music that night and you know the the they felt joy and they felt love and they felt the uplifting effects of the music and they felt really inspired to to go on and, and do other things. And it's moments like that where you feel like, okay, this is so much bigger than than me and so much bigger than the band and so much bigger than just the music. It's actually, you know, providing some sort of service to humanity, to the people that, that need it, uh, that are, that are gravitating toward it. So, you know, those are the moments where you, it really puts things in perspective. Yeah. I, I don't know if that's a, I, it's not necessarily a compliment, but that's where my mind goes to. No, that's a great answer. No, totally. Let me ask you this. You know, everybody has their perception of who you are, your family, your friends, your business associates, the fans and the stands that see you perform. But when you wake up in the morning, who do you think you are? <laughs> who do you think you are? Who do you think uh, you are? <laughs> <laughs> uh, I'm a representation of my soul here on this planet, and I'm here to provide some sort of service to people that want to receive it and I want to do my best to put myself in a position where I'm going to be able to provide that in the most holistic way and you know whatever happens during the day I don't know but that's the position I want to be in you know I know that the name John Diversa is just that's just in passing uh, and that's the name that they put on my driver's license but uh, it's limited. I know that it's much bigger than that. Wonderful. I love that answer. Great answers. John, thank you for opening up. Thanks for your story, your music, and your time, man. I appreciate it. 
I appreciate you. Thanks for spreading the word. Thanks for listening and tuning in to yet another Neon Jazz interview, where we give you a bit of insight into the finest players in Kansas City, L.A., Miami, and spots all over the globe, giving fans all that jazz. And thanks to John for his cool, all that music, and that great story. If you want to hear more interviews, go to Famous Interviews with Joe Domino on the iTunes Store or visit the neonjazz.blogspot.com for all things Neon Jazz. Until next time, enjoy the music, my friends. Neon Jazz.